Mystery Podcast. Welcome again to Mystery Podcast. I'm novelist Sherry Todd Bayshore. For today, I'll share hints beginning with part one and the opening chapter from my romantic suspense thriller, Shadows and Light. The art world is a world of beauty and creativity, but also a world of high stakes value with a darker shadow side. Fate introduced Laura Baker to Neil Mackenzie when the officer had to inform Laura that her husband died in a traffic accident, but suddenly a widow was only her first test. As the months passed, a fateful decision challenges Laura to face a second test that leads her from the shadows of her ambitious late husband into the light of recognition for her own submerged talent. When Neil makes his feelings known and her art gets unexpected international recognition, she's at the crossroads of a third test, but reluctant to risk her new life. Then with a jolt, fate shows Laura a new meaning for risk. Shadows and Light, Part 1, Mountains and Shadows, Chapter 1, Present Time. Lights were dimmed at either end of the corridors. The junior guard on duty dozed in his chair with a half-opened newspaper draped over his chest. The whisperings from inside the locked room halfway down the hall went unheard amid the uneven snoring of other inmates. Jack Peters was senior guard on the night shift. As he rounded the corner, the slouched figure of the sleeping guard came into view. Peters shook his head wearily, then nudged the slumbering man in the leg with the toe of his shoe. The young guard slipped sideways, then sat up with a jerk, startled but awake again. He looked up at his supervisor sheepishly. Jack said nothing to the guard. He didn't need to. Peter stooped to pick up the fallen newspaper, handed it back to the young man, then walked on to check the rest of the floor and the remaining guards stationed in other halls at other levels. Bowden was a small, medium-security prison, but it hadn't always been so. When Jack Peters first started working there 37 years before, it had been a correctional center for young and first-time offenders to get counseling and finish high school. Back then, all of the offenders had been in their early and late teens, but that changed over the decades. Slowly, each of the rooms had been refitted with new doors as well as heavy metal doors between all adjoining corridors. The windows had been sealed with heavy wire mesh. A security fence that that surrounded the grounds outside the perimeter of the buildings were also wired to an alarm system with floodlights powered by the prison's generator. The guards were required to carry guns. By nature, Jack was a gentleman. He liked people, and his years at Bowdoin, even with the changes in the inmate population, hadn't hardened him. He was liked and respected by inmates and fellow guards. Or more accurately, he was liked by those inmates capable of such feelings. However, Jack's years at Bowdoin did cause him to view the prison system like a quilt thrown over a rumpled bed. The bed was covered, but the lumps were still there below the surface, and a few inmates at Bowdoin were extremely nasty lumps. There were five cons who Jack believed should have been in a maximum security prison like Spy Hill, but who so far had either been clever enough or lucky enough to end up at Bowdoin. He stretched just before he passed through another set of locked doors, nodded to the guard working on a crossword puzzle, then moved on to the last section. Static whisperings were followed by a faint scratching sound that came from behind the third locked door of Section A. The novice junior guard ceased dozing and once again slipped into a deep sleep. A thin, slight shaft of metal was maneuvered expertly into place to slide the bolt just far enough so the door could be jimmied open with a quick, almost soundless pop not triggering the alarm. The fine, delicate boned hands of Guy Lester worked patiently. At precisely the right moment, the strong, meaty hands of Bruce Morgan pushed the door ever so slightly. This was strictly a two-man escape, and neither Lester nor Morgan wanted to awaken any other inmates. The newest guard in their section had been like a gift. New guards at other stations had dozed off occasionally during an evening shift, but none with the predictable regularity of young Dennis Hall. As the two men glanced cautiously down the corridor in the direction of the guard's booth, they saw at once that their timing had been perfect. Morgan and Lester were about the same height, but everything else was a distinct opposite. Guy Lester was five feet eight inches, fine-boned and extremely thin. He barely tipped the scales at 145 pounds. Bruce was an inch shorter, but far stockier. Bruce Morgan resembled a football player with muscles that bulged like padding. He was another 32 pounds heavier than his reckless partner, not an ounce of which was fat. Morgan paid about the same level of attention to detail as that of a grazing dairy cow. 
Lester's mind, on the other hand, trapped all information on anything as if it were a valuable leverage tool. With the paper-thin metal retrieved tucked into Lester's shoe, the door reclosed behind them. They dropped to their knees and crawled, hugging the wall. With a top sheet from each of their bunks tied around their waist, Lester carried a coat hanger between his teeth. The crawling figures reached the center of the narrow connecting corridor between A section and C section. Bruce Morgan stood first, walked over to the wall below an upper and lower panel of windows, then braced his back against the wall. Guy Lester stood next, checked both directions, then joined Morgan. Wordlessly, Morgan bent down, cupping his hands to form a foothold for Lester. In one effortless movement, Bruce Morgan raced up as Lester stepped onto his shoulders, their practice made perfect. Deftly maneuvering the end of the coat hanger, Lester pulled an upper window latch sideways, releasing it. The window swung down toward him, held by heavy brass hinges. Lester pulled his body up, gripping the lower edge of the open window frame, and slipped through as easily as a letter in a mail slot. Then awkwardly bent forward, he straddled the window sill and untied a single sheep from around his waist and retied the end of it around the drain pipe from the roof. Morgan quickly nodded one end of his sheet to the free end of Lester's. Beads of nervous perspiration formed across his forehead and along his upper lip. He wished to hell this was over. He gave the knotted linens a slight tug, then pulled himself up the side of the wall with his feet pressed against the narrow space between the lower windows that were still wired to the alarm system. By the time Morgan reached the open window, Lester was already waiting on the ground below. But Morgan only managed to get his head, upper shoulders, and left arm through the narrow window opening. His heavily developed chest became wedged. The more he struggled, the more difficult it became to breathe. Nervous sweat glued his shirt to his skin. He was on the verge of panic. Guy! Bruce's voice was a raspy whisper. I'm stuck in this shittin' window. Can't hardly breathe. He winced as the edge of the casing dug deeper into his ribs. Lester really wanted to leave Morgan just where he was, but he knew Morgan would bring down the entire prison. He had no choice except to help him get through the opening. Quickly, he climbed back up the side of the drain pipe, then leaned over to grip Morgan's free arm and pulled. Morgan's body gave a little, but Lester's grip around the drain pipe slipped, and he started sliding back down. With considerable effort, Lester worked his way up the pipe again. The muscles in his arms stung from unaccustomed strain. This time, when he leaned over, he pulled the tied lengths of the sheets through the open window. Can't shit and breathe. Morgan panted, his face muscles knotted in pain. Shut up, Lester snapped, his tone a hiss more than a whisper. Don't talk, and for piss ass sake, keep it together. Lester looped the free end of the sheet around Morgan's upper left arm, then with one hand fumbled awkwardly to tie it in a knot. Grip the sheet with your other hand here, pointed to a place a short distance from the knot. I'll swing down and hang from the sheet, because it's going to take all my weight to pull you through. Let out all the air from your lungs, grab the edge of the window when I say so. Got it? Morgan nodded weakly. Grabbing the sheet partway down, Lester swung away from the pipe with a jerk. Now! With what little air left in his lungs expelled, Morgan grasped the sheet weighted by Guy Lester's body. He was moved just enough to get his right arm free. With both arms out and taking only shallow breaths, Morgan gripped the upper outside window ledge, then tugged again on the sheet a second time, with Lester still acting as a human weight. He felt a sudden sharp stab in his left side with a second tug that freed his upper chest and back. Lester let himself drop to the ground. Exhausted, Morgan lay bent over the window sill like a wet towel draped on a hook. It hurt to breathe, even though he was free. Shit, Mo, come on. We ain't got goddamn we. Morgan eased further through the window, enough to get his left leg out and straddle the sill. His left side felt on fire as he unknotted the sheet and let them both drop to the ground. Reaching the drain pipe, Morgan winced with the effort it took to hold on with his left hand and close the window using the end of the coat hanger. On the ground beside Lester, Morgan shivered with the chilled air against his sweat-soaked t-shirt under his jumpsuit. Lester rolled up both sheets for their next hurdle. Crouching close to the ground, Lester and Morgan were shrouded in shadow as they moved away from the northeast corner of the main building. The only outside lights were fixed and mounted to each roof on the front corner guard towers. 
Each tower was a bulletproof glass-enclosed platform 20 feet from ground level. The only rotating floodlights were activated. The alarm sounded. The cons watched both guards for a full minute. One guard had his head down, intently writing. The second guard, at the opposite corner of the front yard, wore headphones and swayed, bobbed, then swirled in shaky movements. Morgan tapped Lester on the shoulder, pointing. Shit, one's writing his goddamn memoirs and the other's farting around to music. Lester nodded. He wasn't surprised. The converted reformatory wasn't built for hardened adult criminals. Many of the guards at Bowden were original staff, not expecting much in the way of trouble. Bruce and Guy separated, working their way to the front gates from the opposite direction. Morgan moved slower, gripping his left side as a sharp pain jabbed. They kept close to but not touching the electrified high-wire fence. When they reached the gate, Morgan held his side, and it was obvious to Lester that Morgan wouldn't be able to give him a leg up over the top of the gate first. Instead, he rechecked the position of both guards, then refolded his sheet with Morgan's, then threw them over the top to cover the gate with multiple layers. This time, Lester fit his hands together in a toehold clasp. When Morgan stepped into Lester's hands, he tried to straighten up. Lester staggered and nearly fell as Morgan grabbed for the top sheet, covered gate, then hauled himself over the top from his right side and down the front of the gate, out of the compound. The sheets overlapped and draped just enough to cover the top and down on either side of the gate as protection from the electrical current. Even so, Morgan had felt a slight tremor that left him a little shaky after dropping to the ground. By this time, his left side felt as if it might explode. The pulsating pain was so intense, it was as if his blood had been brought to a boil inside his ribcage. Lester's nerves were shreds. As flat to the ground as he could get, he watched the guards. If he fumbled his attempt to get over the top, he'd either be fried or spotted or both. The guard in the northeast tower was still seated with his head down in exactly the same position, and the guard in the southeast tower was still dancing to music. He jumped up and sprang to grab the top of the eight-foot gate, pulled his body over, taking the sheets with him. A slight shiver of current went through him. His hands gripped the top of the gate. As he landed on the road to the other side, he was fine. Morgan had moved to the side of the road out of sight. Lester ducked down again and made one quick parting check of the guards. The seated guard in the north tower was stretching his arms high above his head, and the guard in the south tower was removing his headphones. Lester joined Morgan and stayed low, half walking, half crawling toward a farmer's field to the north of the prison. It was one twelve a.m. The breakfast head count was not until eight. They had an impressive, almost seven-hour head start. This ends the last page of Chapter 1 in Part 1. Thank you for listening. If you're intrigued so far, please tune in again tomorrow to hear Chapter 2.